I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that's a short text. We can get out of here in 10 minutes. Well, you're wrong. We could, but we won't. It's simple, isn't it, though, when you look at it? The submission that is required of children, because in all of these cases, it is the one who is placing themselves under the authority is listed first. Wives, place yourselves under the authority of your husband. And then there's a greater instruction to the husbands. When it comes to children, children are listed first. Children, we're simple, place yourselves under the authority of your parents. How? Through obedience. And if you look in the Colossians, the parallel verse in Colossians is in everything. In everything. Pretty simple. And then there's a larger discussion on parenthood and what to do. Uh, and, and that submission is, and we'll get to that in just a moment, there's a mutual submission in parent-child relationship. So the first thing I want us to do is look at this clear command that is given right up front. It is a clear command. Let's go back and look at it again. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. The word that is used there um, for children, techna, it doesn't mean necessarily little children. It doesn't mean, it doesn't specify any age at all. What it simply means is, and it's a close relational term, and even closer than yeos, which is son, um, it means uh, a close relationship. It is talking about a parent-child relationship, one that is a close relationship. That's what the word means. It doesn't have anything to do with age. It doesn't talk about whether one is a, a small child or whether one is uh, married and out of the home. It doesn't say. It just simply says this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So there is a qualification to this command, and then there is a motivation in this command as well. Children, obey your parents. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb. He's going to talk about honoring your parents, and let me say this right off the bat. That as long as a child is at home, and this is understood here with this term, as long as a child is at home, then there will be obedience. What about if a child is out of the home, on their own, they're married, or in our society they might not be married. In this society, certainly they would have been if they were out on their own, they would have been married. Uh, but if they're, if they're out on their own, the mom and dad's not paying the bills, not feeding, not putting food on the table, not paying the phone bill, not doing all that kind of stuff, you're, you're out on your own. Then it becomes to honor or to obey that obedience is shown, uh, it becomes respect and care for. We'll get to more of that in just a minute, but I want you to be thinking clearly. That this applies, this command applies, honoring, being obedient to applies throughout one's life. There's no statute of limitations on it. I am still required. I have a mother and a father. I am required to respect them and care for them. Certainly now as they are entering their older years, older age, I am to care for them. Why? Because I respect them. I love them. And that's my responsibility. Children, obey your parents. Now, I know what you're saying. What if my parents are scoundrels? We'll get to that another time. But now we're talking about the ideal, okay? My parents, I wouldn't obey them. They want me to rob a bank. Okay, in the Lord, you get that part? Get the qualification. How is a child supposed to obey their parents? In the Lord, which, by the way, means the same thing as fear. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. What did we say that meant? Because these are synonymous phrases. What did we say that meant? Do you remember? It means respect, awe, reverence, recognizing who Christ is. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is the, the, the eternal Son, the second person of the Trinity. He is the one who died for us on the cross. He's the one who paid our, the, the sin debt for us. Uh, he is our Lord, our Savior. So, and be subject to one another. Why? What is the reason for it? Because of who Christ Jesus is. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And so we are subject to one another because what he has done for us. Because he wills it. Because that is what he has prescribed for us as a community of faith. So, when you apply that to this one, children obey your parents in the Lord. That means the same thing. So, these are children that are not infants. These are not, oh, look at them. Not infants. Infants don't have any choice. 
Okay? These are old enough to understand the gospel. These are children that are of the faith. These are children that are part of the congregation. They are old enough to understand when this letter is read out loud, which it was read out loud in the congregation, children would have understood it. Obey your parents out of respect, reverence, fear of the Lord Jesus Christ. So our obedience is as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it comes down to this. If your parents are demanding, asking, uh, telling you to do that which dishonors the Lord Jesus Christ, then you must not keep it because what's first? Your relationship with God first, your relationship with spouse second, your relationship to children second, I mean third. So children, our relationship to Christ Jesus always takes priority. Always cancels out everything else. Our, let's say the government says, you must do this so-and-so. You must kill this class of people. As it was in Nazi Germany. You must turn these in. You must, uh, we're going to, these are horrible people, blah, blah, blah. And some said, well, we've got to be obedient to government. No, we have to be obedient to Christ, first and foremost. So that's first. That's the same in marriage. We'll talk about that when we get to looking at what if it goes wrong. Our obedience is to Christ first. It is always qualified with that, that our obedience is unto Christ. That's why we do it. Why should a wife place herself under the authority of her husband? Because Christ said to do it. And only so long as it is in keeping with Christ. So if that husband is demanding immoral, ungodly things, if he is uh, leading her into sin, she should not place herself under that. That's not what Christ would have. So children are supposed to be abused and live that way? No. This is in the Lord. It's qualified, and that is a big qualification. For this is right. What's the motivation? It's righteousness. Actually, that's what the word means, dikaio. It means righteousness. Usually, it's referred to the righteousness of God. So what have you got? Children who are under their parents are supposed to be obedient. Children who are outside of their parents, who are no longer fed and clothed and all of that kind of stuff by their parents. They are to respect and care for. They, they show that submission to them continually for this is right. In other words, this is righteousness. Well, that takes us back. It's a clear command, isn't it? It's not hard to understand. Is anyone scratching their head going, I don't get it? No. Children who are under their parents are to be obedient. Secondly, it is a consistent command. Did you notice verse 3? I mean verse 2. Honor your father and mother, which comes from, by the way, <clears throat> in Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. And what he's quoting is from the LXX, and it's a lot closer, the Septuagint, doesn't matter, you don't need to know that, I said that for myself. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise. What's the promise? That it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. All right, let's talk about this for a second, because this is a consistent command. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is righteousness. Honor your father and mother, which is the command. What's he doing? Without any introduction to it, he goes back to the Old Testament. And what he's saying is this, this has always been the expectation of God in family relationships. It's the, f one, two, three, four, five. Uh, it's number five in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And it's on the same page as the one that has to do with honoring God. So that honoring our parents, which in the Old Testament is always obedience, if you're under them, and if you're outside of their home, then it's to care for and respect, always. Always means that. How do we honor parents? If you're under them by being obedient, how do you honor them if you're outside of their home? By respecting them and caring for them. 
All right, so we're to honor our mother and father, both parents, not just dad, both parents, which is interesting in a patriarchal society. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So what does that mean? Well, it means this. What is the promise? That it may be well with you that you may live long on the earth. So God has consistently, throughout his salvation history, whether it was the people of Israel or now in the New Testament church, that children are always to place themselves under the authority of their parents instead of rebelling against them. And if they will, God says it will go well with you, that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. And let me tell you how that's interpreted or how that's translated. That it may be well with you, that it's going to go well with you in your life. Why? Is this a guarantee? Is it a blank check? Oh, it's going to go well, man, I'm going to live to be 115 years old. No. It's a general prescription. And by the way, as I get older, the less and less I want to make it to 115. You know what I'm saying? I, I am ready to take the flight and go right now. And you say, yes, we are too. Go. Um, at any moment. That it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. That you may, and actually what that means, it's not that you're going to live 100 years. It means you're going to live a full life or have a fullness of life. And that's better, isn't it, than living 150 years? Isn't it better to have a fullness of life? And let's say you leave this earth at 50, 60, 70, whatever it may be, however many years we have. But the years that you have, and God knows them from the beginning, before you ever were born, he knew exactly it's written down when you're going to depart this earth. You're not going to miss that appointment. You're going to keep it. You're not going to be late. You're not going to be early. You're going to be right on time. And that's a good thing. God doesn't intend for us to stay in this corrupt place forever. I'm thankful. We're going to be delivered from this body of death. Thank goodness. So it's not about living 120 years. It's about the fullness of life. A full life. And I want to say to you, right here, this morning, right now, if my great getting up morning is tomorrow, that's fine. I've had a full life. I really have. Well, aren't you lucky? No. No, I'm not. Luck has nothing to do with it. The blessing of God. The grace of God. And he says that this is dependent upon and is a result of our being obedient to parents. Were you always obedient to your mom and dad? No, I wasn't. But we'll get to that in just a minute. This is God's promise. That you will, it'll go well with you, and that you'll have a fullness of life. Now, what does it mean to go well with? Well, think with me for a minute. If children learn obedience at home, Discipline, their obedience to the authority of their parents, who, by the way, represent the image of God in the home, which is why homosexual marriage doesn't work, and why I just get outraged when you have children brought up in that environment, because it, it misses the whole point of family. But governments decide that they can redefine what God has created, and, and we get in a big mess. For it to go well, if a child learns obedience in the home and respect for authority and recognizes God and respects and reveres God because parents respect and revere God, then that child is going to respect the authority figure's teacher we talked about this morning and prayed about, will respect those teachers, will be obedient to those authority figures, will be disciplined in their work ethic will do their work, will do their studies. Perfectly, no. Children are children after all. You see the point. You realize that prior to 1965, for the most part, in the life of this nation, 
children were obedient to parents. Children did respect authority. Do you know why? Do you know what was kicked out in the mid-60s? Prayer was kicked out. That's true. But what we as a nation did was kick God out. And if you kick God out, then you lose all sense of respect for authority because you lose all sense of a reason for authority. It becomes all about what I want, what I desire, what makes me feel good. In fact, the baby boom generation, my generation is not called the me generation for nothing. It was in that generation that we saw this great seed sown. And now we reap and continue to reap what was sown. We sow to the, we sow to the flesh and unrighteousness and what have we reaped? Dissension, disrespect, selfishness, greed, violence, immorality. The list goes on and on. Which is no wonder because Paul says the very same thing in Romans. That when you throw God out, he lets you go and you reap that reward. You reap what is sown. God is not mocked. So if you want children to live well, and to do well. And this is something parents have to learn because we've lost it. We've lost it. In fact, C.S. Lewis pointed it out when all this first started developing in the early 60s. C.S. Lewis pointed out that we cannot even <laughs> have dogs learn obedience. How in the world can these parents, these modern parents, ever teach obedience to their children? And he's right. How many times have you seen children running the home? Mom and dad's running here, running there, running everywhere. And it's our fault. It's not children's fault. Because the children aren't the ones signing up for soccer and baseball and softball and this and that and the other thing. Where we run here, run there, run all over the place. I'm just too exhausted. I can't have a quiet time with God. I've got to run over here. I can't spend. I got to. We got to do this. We got to do that. We got to do cheerleading. We got to go over here. We got this. We got this school. Then we got a band. We got this. We got that. And we feed that selfishness. We feed that ego, don't we? We do. And God calls us back to this. Children, obey your parents. Learn obedience. Learn discipline. But here again, as with the wife-husband relationship, a child won't have a problem. Well, yeah, they will a little bit because we are rebellious by nature. But a child will come closer to obeying parents without a whole lot of trouble if parents hold up their end and instruct and discipline their children in the Lord. It's a consistent command. God has always expected it. The children are going to be obey their parents. And that if they do, it will go well with them. Generally speaking, it will go well. They will have a fullness of life. And it will go well with them because they've learned to respect. And we're dangerously close to losing that because we've had a couple of generations come up. And there is no sense of respect anymore, is there? Children, obey your parents. Here's the third thing. A careful command. It's a consistent command. It's a clear command. Obey your parents. It's a consistent command in that God has always required it. Thirdly, it's a careful command. I want to go to this one. And fathers, in verse 4. Do not, this is... Two qualifications. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. One's negative, one's positive. Two instructions. A negative instruction is do not, and secondly, a positive instruction, do this. So what's the do not? Do not provoke your children to anger. Now, I'm going to quote to you. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. This would rule out excessively severe discipline. 
unreasonably harsh demands, abuse of authority, arbitrariness, unfairness, constant nagging and condemnation, subjection to humiliation, forms of gross insensitivity to a child's needs or sensibilities. All of that's included in that do not provoke your children to anger. Do not cause them to explode really is what, what the term is. Have you ever seen children explode? I have. Well, they just boom. They lose it. Well, what he's saying is, don't do these things. Don't humiliate your children. And did you re- let me read that list again. Excessively severe discipline, unreasonably harsh demands, abuse of authority, arbitrariness, unfairness, constant nagging, condemnation, subjection to humiliation, forms of gross insensitivity to a child's needs or sensibilities. And then you ask this question, what's the point of having kids if you can't do that stuff? Who are you supposed to humiliate? Can't humiliate grown-ups. They might hit you. Who are you supposed to? Some of that stuff, you know, don't get the idea that the scripture is against chastising. It's not. But it's about chastising the right way in the right place. There's a place God created right there. That's why it's padded. My dad got around that, though, because he went for here. I'll get him back, though. So he's having surgery Tuesday, and he'll be in a wheelchair, and his, he won't have anything in his leg from here to here except antibiotic cement. Um, when he first had that surgery 10 years ago, I didn't know how to drive a wheelchair, and I took him over a step, and that leg went up in the air and came down. <laughs> and he thought the rapture had happened. <laughs> So I'm looking forward to that. (laughs) Do not provoke your children to anger. That one's easy. Don't provoke them. Don't be arbitrary in in handing out discipline. It's funny one day, it's not funny the next. Oh, it's cute when they do that today, but it's not cute tomorrow. That's frustrating for a child. Don't have outrageous demands that they can't live with. That's ridiculous. Where is it? (laughs) You know, you know this about your children. I'm getting this from Sinbad because he taught me, the comedian, he taught me this. You know that not all children are exceptional in everything they do. You know that, right? You do know that. Are are the children out of here? I don't want to give away any secrets. There's a lot of times these children bring stuff that they've drawn or colored and you, oh, isn't that marvelous? Isn't that wonderful? It's not. And sometimes they'll be singing, and they can't sing. And we say, oh, they got the most beautiful voice, and you want to sing in church, and let them sing in the choir, and let them, oh, they need to have a special. No, they don't. They don't. And Sinbad said, you need to cut that stuff off. He said, not every child can do everything. He said, that's why we have the first week of American Idol, because somebody didn't cut that stuff off. Some parent didn't take time to get involved with that child and cut that stuff off. That's frustrating to a child too, isn't it? Don't lie to them. You know, my dad, <laughs> my dad wanted me to play baseball so bad. I played football. I loved football. I couldn't play baseball. I couldn't, I couldn't hit anything. I couldn't, number one, I didn't wear my glasses so I couldn't see. Um, I was pulling for a walk or to get hit, one or the other. That was my thing. And uh, finally, they let me off the hook and let me quit. But uh, I played Little League, uh, Minor League, Little League, Babe Ruth, all that stuff. And I just didn't enjoy it. I wasn't in it. And, you know, that was frustrating for me because I didn't enjoy it at all. But my dad wanted me to play. My dad should have just been honest and said, you know what, you ain't got it. You really, you've you've got an arm like a first baseman. You really, you can't, you can't play this game. Let's let's look for something else. Um, Maybe something involves sitting down. Let's, Let's do that. That's frustrating. Don't do that to your children. That's exasperating. That, that causes them to explode. It's frustrating. I hated it when practice would come around. I didn't want to go. Um, I just use that as an example. You can think of other ways, probably in your own childhood, where how your parents frustrated you, how they provoked you. And really, what this requires to not do this is you've got to stop and engage your parenting as a parent. You've got to stop and really know your children, don't you? You've got to stop and look at them. 
You can't just be running here and there and running everywhere. You've got to stop and get to know them. You've got to know what their likes and dislikes are, how they're gifted, what they can do, what they can't do. And be honest. Lovingly direct them in the path they should go in. You've got to be involved with them. Uh Uh-oh, did we lose my thing? I'll try it again. Secondly, don't do that, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's two things happening there. One, there's instruction. The other one has to do with chastisement. One, you don't chastise before the instruction. Why? Because that's provoking them to anger. Um, Well, when should I spank my children? (laughs) I said, don't do it when you're angry. When should you do it? (laughs) When I'm feeling good? (laughs) Instruction. And what the word means is they're going to be trained. They're going to be taught. They're going to be instructed in how to live, how to be. And that, that means you're involved with them. That means you're teaching them. By the way, did you know this? People get all upset about Ten Commandments not in school, Ten Commandments not in the courthouse, Ten Commandments not here, not there. Did you know the Ten Commandments were given to be put in the home? It's in the home they're supposed to be taught. It's in the home the instruction in the Lord is supposed to be taught. Not school. It's nice if it is in school, but it's in the home where it's supposed to be. Did you know that if things like this were taught, if the things of Christ were taught in the home as they should be, it wouldn't take very long before Christ would be in school. It's a careful command. We on me or we on you? On you? Okay. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Don't discipline before you instruct. You can't discipline before you instruct because discipline is supposed to bring you back to the instruction. It is a correction. So teach your children. Teach them and the instruction of the Lord. Doesn't mean you instruct them about the Lord. Well, yes, that goes without saying. But it means to instruct them in a characteristically Christian way. They are going to learn the faith from you. They're going to learn how to live from you. And how are they best going to learn it, mom and dad? They're best going to learn it by seeing you live it out. A picture is worth a thousand words. Remember that? You cannot expect your children to be what you are not. You can't teach them Christ and not live it. They won't get it. I had a dear friend, his name's Tom Baskin. He's gone to be with the Lord now. But he and I were traveling back from a mission encounter. It was a long drive, and he began to pour out his heart. None of his children were active in the church. They lived in town, but they weren't active. They spent all the weekends away doing other things with their kids and so forth. Tom and his wife, Mary, were very active in church. There, anything was going on, active deacon, everything was going on. He said to me, and this was shocking to me, he said to me, you know what, Pastor, when I was bringing up my family, I did wrong. I said, what do you mean? And tears began to come down his face because I'd been trying to get his son involved in church. And he said, when I was an executive working, I thought it would be nice to have a lake cabin and to take my children there on Sundays. Now, we always had worship with our family or in the camp. We would have our devotion. We would read before you know, we would ever do anything else. He said, but you know what I have come to realize over the years? That the lesson my children took away from me was that being in God's house on Sunday wasn't as important as having fun on the lake. No matter what I said with my mouth, no matter what I read from God's word, my actions taught more than my words taught. And he said, and I'm, I can't go back and change it. I plead with my son. I beg with my son. He said, but I can't go back and change it. So parents, listen up. You have them for a little while to teach them, to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. 
I want you to ask a question because the greater burden lies on parents, not on children. Children obey. Parents don't exasperate them, which means you've got to analyze your parenting. You've got to look at what you're doing. You've got to take the time to look at it. You've got to take the time to pray about it. You've got to take the time to read God's Word to see how you're supposed to be bringing these children up. Secondly, you are to actively instruct them. And I believe teachers would just, teachers in school, we prayed for our teachers, teachers would just love for you to take the time to instruct them in how to behave and how to live morally, decently, and in the Lord. In the admonition, nurture them. Nurture them, bring them up to maturity. That's what the word means. So ask yourself, parents, what am I teaching my children with my actions? How am I instructing my children? Not with my words, but with what I do. Now here's my invitation. We come to a close. You remember the beginning of this? You can't do any of this. Parenting or even being an obedient child to your parents and caring for them as you come into understanding without the filling of the Holy Spirit. So in order to be a godly home, it's got to be a Christian home. In order for it to be a Christian home, then Christ must be Lord and Savior. So I invite you first to praise